Hello everybody and welcome to today's XP Live webinar. My name is Nicole Highhouse and I'm the Marketing Manager here in the XP Solutions Portland office. Today's presenter is Tony Cooch, our Vice President of Client Services. Tony has been with XP Solutions for over 22 years. He's trained thousands of XP users, provided technical and engineering support, and continues to drive the development of XP Swim and XP Storm. Tony is basically our XP Swim guru, which means that today you are in very good hands. Thanks for joining us today, and Tony, would you like to take it away? Yes, thanks, Nicole. Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk to you about um, 2D results, uh, the tools that are in the software. You know, I get a lot of personal pleasure out of being able to provide training for XP Swim and XP Storm, and, and I'm also involved in the technical support services. You know, XP, XP Solutions had a long history providing these kinds of services with our software, and we take great pride in, in that, and it's very fulfilling. We really want, you know, we would say the number one customer is a customer who understands the software, uses it frequently, you know, and excels in their work by applying the software. And so this type of a webinar where it's really been directed or geared towards the people who are already users of the software and making them better users rather than more of the industry knowledge type webinars that we often uh, provide. So before we get going, and you know we still have a few people logging in as well at the last minute, we'd like to um, have a poll and just I would like to know essentially what your experience is currently with XP Swim or XP Storm. Right, that, that screen is on everybody's uh, interface right now, so let us know if you're mostly 1D modelers or if you do 1D, 2D modeling. Um, we'd also like to know if you've never used XP Swim or XP Storm before. This is a great, this is going to be a great exposure to you uh, on what our XP 2D results look like. Or, you know, if, if you don't typically do modeling and are just curious what kind of results are available, that's going to be very helpful to us today. Very close. I think we have almost equal measures of folks who do 1D, who do 2D, who have never used the software before, and who don't typically do modeling. So that's great. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see what the questions are going to be as we go through this uh, webinar. Thanks. All right. Before we get going, I suppose, on a specific topic of looking at processing 2D results, you know, a lot of the models that you're going to build are actually going to be integrated 1D, 2D models, where there's going to be some 1D elements within those models, as well as 2D. And there are specific results and input data that actually belong to the 1D model, but it's about how those objects are interacting with 2D models. So I'd like to take a quick look at those, uh, maybe with the perspective of the 2D modeling aspects, and those are going to be looking at XP tables, perhaps a lesser known quick data view tool. We'll look at some animations of the HGL in long section, cross sections, and perhaps in the dynamic plan view, and we might be able to infer with those perhaps what does it mean the hydraulic grade line, where it's at compared to what it might mean for transferring water to the 2D model. And then a couple of plan view markups as well called spatial reports and graphical encoding. So let me quickly move over to the software and work with those with you. So I have a already created model that will show up in just a moment on your screens as it's kind of fed to you over the internet there, depending on your internet speed. This is an integrated 1D, 2D model where in the residential area, the links and nodes there represent uh, storm sewers and manholes, and the manholes are connected to the 2D model through link spill crest to 2D. There is some upstream and some downstream natural channels. I could just perhaps show you here edit data, it's a natural channel, and it's been connected 
to the 2D model such that when the flow goes over the banks, it will be introduced to 2D model. In order to mitigate some flooding that might happen in the urban area, this model has a pond, and that pond is here in the different color of green. I've created a, a fill area polygon with a new uh, constant elevation representing the bottom of the pond, and you'll notice perhaps once we start looking at some of the model results that this pond fills up and you can see that both in plan view and of course with the different modeling results tools. So it's a little bit about the model. So first I wanted to talk about um, XP tables. Now XP tables can be accessed from the results menu by choosing the keyboard equivalent of F2 or just by clicking on the icon for XP tables right here on the toolbar. I have several tables that have been set up and I just recently created one for this webinar called Node 1D 2D Results. This XP table has some headers, for example in black in larger font uh, you can see uh, a, a global sort of heading for the table then it's subdivided into a Node Data and Node Results section with some subheadings and their different colors. You can see, for example, that while most of the table is in metric, my model happened to be a metric model, that I've customized uh, one of the columns, max volume, and I've customized it by converting it into, um, into cubic feet. So I've got, if you will, mixed units in the XP table. The XP table is easily um, adjusted or you know set up by clicking this setup table variables icon and there's a tree control over here on the left that has all the model input data and all the model results so for example if I wanted to add something to the table I could expand the tree for example hydraulics node hydraulics node um, results and then I could look through the results and perhaps there might be something interesting in the flooding results. Uh, this here, volume of ponded flow stored. I could uh, simply drag and drop that to the right side or I could append it to the bottom of the list and I can format it by simply um, editing this title uh, I'll just call it perhaps ponded flow. Click the, oh, maybe I will change the precision to maybe just one value after the decimal. Click OK button and OK button again. And I can see the ponded flow volumes as a new column in my current table. So the XP tables, you can have many, you know, they accept copy-paste, cells that are white allow you to make an edit, cells that are gray are um, blocked from editing because they happen to be a model result or just something that's, you know, we're blocking from editing, maybe something that we're computing on the fly would be another example. The XP tables have shown up as another tab inside of the software if you had multiple screens, if you had you know, a 4K screen, you wanted to pull this tab off and truly make it a separate work area, workspace, you can tear it off. Now I've got like a split screen where I can see the plan view versus the XP table at the same time. The XP tables have a connection to the plan view. For example, if I select some links and nodes and spawn the XP table, it will actually put the highlighted items in yellow in the XP table and vice versa if, for example, I wanted to explore and find the object in the plan view that had all of this uh, duration of surcharge and the flow that's been transferred to the 2D model, selecting it here in the table, then clicking this icon in the toolbar will actually highlight that object and put it in the middle of the screen. And so I can have that association between the table and also the plan view. The other tool that's related to XP tables that I wanted to share with you is called Quick Data View. 
the quick data view is accessed by clicking this icon on the toolbar or from the results menu. The quick data view um, resides in the same space that you find the layers and there will be a tab below for you to switch between the layer control panel and the quick data view. The quick data view works on one table at a time. You choose from the combo box the various tables that you would like to look at, whether that be for nodes or for links. You could choose the table. And as you navigate through the network and you click on various objects, for example, on a node, it brings up the information for that node where I could make edits, for example. It's essentially a user-defined dialog. You've chosen the columns of your table, which present here as rows in the quick data view. And as you click on objects, you could basically have kind of like a heads-up display. So, for example, I've picked this link, and I can see that the max flow to the design flow is a ratio of 1.9. It's basically taking more flow than the design flow design flow being calculated with Manning's equation and using the bed slope in the Manning equation, assuming, if you will, a uniform flow uh, and a normal flow condition. The other thing that's in here is that I have a capacity term called D over D, the depth of flow over the diameter. A value of 0.5 would mean the conduit is half full a value of one completely full, a value of more than one that it's surcharged. Of course, I can see in here that the value is surcharged by looking at, you know, this being greater than one. It's much greater than one. It's a surcharged case. So this quick data view could be toggled on or off by this icon on the toolbar. You can also click this X here for quick data view in addition to being able to toggle it on or off. So the quick data view, it's really, I like thinking of it as that user-defined dialogue where I get to pick the things that I'd like to see. I can navigate the network and, uh, and look at it. It also can display any type of GIS data that would be made visible. So for example, if I um, turn on this GIS files where I have the nodes, from GIS, I'm just going to turn off the actual objects in XP. So if I click, for example, the node and I look in the quick data view, it's switched to the GIS tab. I can select multiple objects. For example, I can pick a second one and a third one, etc. And it's displaying all the attributes that are found in the with the GIS objects. So the quick data view is not only for the main XP modeling objects, it's also perhaps for any linked GIS files. Back to the layer control panel. I'd like to perhaps put back my links and nodes and then I will also perhaps infer with you that surcharge condition. So if I go back up to that part of the network that I saw was surcharged, you know, I can select a set of links and nodes just by clicking on one node, holding the shift key, perhaps clicking here, and then I could see this in the dynamic long section. The dynamic long section can also contain XP tables where there are options to turn them on or off, whether that be the node or the link tables. That gives you a little bit more real estate as far as displaying the hydraulic grade line, the ground and invert. You know, I'm kind of like zoomed in by turning off the space that was taken by the tables. The magenta line is the maximum hydraulic grade line at any time. And I can see in that region where I had found that the conduit was surcharged that the hydraulic grade line is above the ground. This is also an indication that some water has exchanged between the 1D model and the 2D model. As I play it, there's animation controls. You could loop, rewind, go back a step, pause, advance it one step at a time. Here I am advancing one time step to the next. 
and the blue line now is the hydraulic grade line at the given time step. Of course, if I play it, I could then maybe um, find a period of time that's of interest. Maybe let me back this up so I can see the case where it's uh, above the ground, and you'll see there's a flooded symbol. Let me just find that. Here we are. So at 15 minutes into the simulation, the hydraulic grade line happens to be at its maximum here, and I show this flooded wavy symbol. Essentially, that water has escaped the 1D network, in our case, gone into the 2D model. There are other animations, um, and you know how I've gone here and selected this network. In fact, that's something that can be remembered. For example, earlier the, today, I went into the view, save view, and saved a view of selected objects, and I can actually restore that, and I've called it profile. So that is the selection from this upstream part in the channel all the way to this downstream part in the channel, one continuous set of links and nodes. That could be shown perhaps in the animation called the dynamic section views. In this case, I probably definitely would be inclined to turn off the tables for the links and nodes since it took up a little bit of space and I wanted to see the profile a little bit better. These um, panes are um, movable so you could get more or less emphasis on the hydrographs or the cross-section graphs. This is all a set of synchronized views and as I play it, I'll just pause it at a point in time here, you can see the level of the water at the downstream end of each conduit in cross-section. You can see the profile view, the current water level compared to the maximum, and the hydrograph view as well. The vertical dashed red line shows you where you are in time. So if I was to maybe advance this a little bit right to about the peak, you can see, of course, then in the profile, the current water level is very close to the maximum hydraulic grade line. You've got this flooded symbol here that will occur whenever the hydraulic grade line is at or above the ground. I can zoom, of course, into here, and that's somewhat a great indication about the exchange between water between 1D and 2D. That actually happens to be something that can be visualized. I know from the earlier profile that this node, for example, flooded. And if I looked at that in the review results time series, I can see, for example, that the maximum, well, the hydraulic grade line went above the surface. And it created a cumulative overflow, which is the yellow time series, of about 113 cubic meters has exited out the top of the node into the ground. Another type of animation, this would probably be the last one, and then I'm going to move on to look at the plan view markups, that was, is called the dynamic plan view. The dynamic plan view is a tool that will animate by changing the color of the link as well as the link thickness based on the flow or the velocity, and will mark the nodes with a color based on where the hydraulic grade line is. It's an animation has the same DVR controls, which I can play. I've paused it at a strategic time here, where I can see I have some flooding happening at this node and this node. So the color of the link indicates the flow rate, and so does the thickness, as well as the nodes now are color-coded. So some of the nodes are yellow. So it means that the hydraulic grade line at those points in time is less than a user-defined freeboard. But in the beginning of the simulation, just a few minutes in, I should be able to see these manholes here are flooding. They are indicated by red and the flooded wavy symbol. So these are the animations that actually are supportive for your um, 1D 2D modeling, and of course they're indicating some exchange of water between 1D and 2D. The plan view markups are called spatial reports and graphical encoding. Let me introduce those to you. The spatial reports, if I right-click and choose properties, 
are boxes or brackets of information that are tied with a leader line to the various links and nodes. The link variable here, I can see that I have this list. If you choose insert, you can add more items. And then once you add them to the list, you can format them on how they're displayed on the screen. In this case, I'm displaying the max flow to design flow fraction. I'm going to display that as QP for peak flow divided by QD for design flow. I'll click the OK button, the OK button again. Likewise, for the node variables, I have a few items in here. The time flooded, the 1D, 2D water transfer uh, are just some examples as well as the node name. So I'm going to click the OK button and the OK button again. And these things, while they could be turned on for all objects or just selected objects with a right click, I find more often than not, rather than creating a whole lot of clutter on the screen, uh, for example, this is all the nodes being displayed, well, that's a lot of clutter. So I find more often than not that I would rather show it as a tooltip for the nodes and the links. If I turn these on, and I simply like go and hover my cursor on a link or a node, I'll get the pop-up tooltip with the information that I'd like to see. So for example, I can see this link MH0302 ha is basically surcharged with the peak flow over the design flow being greater than one. For the nodes, for example, um, if I just hover on a node, I can find the amount of time that a node was flooded. This one flooded for six minutes with that same 113 cubic meters per second. This node with 67 cubic meters per second of flooding, and it lasted for five minutes. Now, sometimes you'd like maybe a heads-up display. I know that's drilling down to the details, but what about just quickly identifying all the nodes that flood? This tool is called graphical encoding. The graphical encoding, I'll right click and choose properties. The graphical encoding works by selecting an attribute and it's the same kind of list that you saw before. So for example, if I click here, I can then choose a variable that's going to be mapped to this visual entity, which in this case happens to be node color. And I've picked from the list the time flooded in minutes. Once you pick an item on the left, it then enables the um, range selection that you might make in that visual entity. So if we click on node color, you can see here that I've got basically two colors, green and red. For the green and red, I'm going to say if there's no flooding, 0 to 0 0.001 minutes, it's green. If there's any flooding, well, one thousandth of a minute or more, then up to one day, it's going to turn red. So green nodes, no flood, red nodes, flood. Pretty easy way to look at the screen. Let's look at the water transfer. This is going to be mapped to the node size. The largest transfer between water between 1D and 2D happens to be um, about 4,200 cubic meters. So I'm scaling the size of the node. So if, if it's between 0 and 1 cubic meters, it's 3 millimeters in size. It will be 8 millimeters in size if it happens to be 5,000. All right, so I've got the range covered. Likewise, I've got the link depth over the diameter. That's a capacity term being modeled with these three colors that if it's half full or less, it's green. If it's a half full to completely full, it's orange. And then it's red if it's surcharged. In fact, there's at least one conduit that has a level of surcharge of 4.5915 times its diameter. We'll be able to quickly identify these. I've turned on the legend as well. I sometimes fill the nodes when I uh, mark their colors so it's just easier to see them. And I'll click the encode button and turn this layer on. And now you can see, for example, here's a really large red node. Well, 
it floods, hence it's red. It has a lot of 1D, 2D transfer, hence its size. This one, likewise as well, it's much smaller, but that's because its amount of flooding is 113 versus 4,261. All right, we can turn off the graphical encoding uh, as to, so we can put the screen back to normal. I wanted to um, maybe just provide you a little bit more detail on that idea of the exchange between 1D and 2D. In the 2D model, under Analyze, there's a simulation summary. So this is basically a global summary of my 2D model. There is an echo of a lot of the input data up here in this um, in these cells up here, and there's four graphs that can be generated. For example, change in volume, cumulative mass air, flow in, flow out. But it's for the entire model. So, for example, if I look at flow in, this is detail about the over time what are the flow rates going into the 2D model. While some of that could be 2D model objects only, in my case it's really um, 1D. So the only inputs I have in this model are is hydrology at the various nodes and then a hydrograph at the most upstream node in the channel. So this is the flux of flow from 1D model into 2D. Now let me go back to my PowerPoint presentation for a moment. I've basically been talking about that ability to look at these various hydrographs. So, of course, you have change in volume, uh, change in volume over time. Positive or negative would be just the perspective of you know increasing or decreasing the volume on the 2D model. The cumulative mass error, which I can see at the end of the simulation, is down under a half percent, plus minus. So that's a pretty tight simulation. The goal is under 2%. I've got the inflow and the outflow hydrographs as far as the perspective of 2D. Now, if you would like to know the hydrographs in some detail of the exchange between the 1D and the 2D model, this is possible. Um, this slide essentially has come from our knowledge base on the support portal. The question was, how can I review the hydrographs pass between the 2D and the 1D model. While that 2D simulation summary had an overall, what about the individual nodes? Well, since version 2013, inside of XP Swim or XP Storm, you can actually output the time series of the flow between the 2D and 1D parts of the model. You do this by first going to the 2D job control and making sure that produce check files is selected, and second, in the 2D advanced, you write into the control file section, write X1D check files with a value of on. This creates four CSV files. There are um, four CSV, CSV files because there is a set of files, two files, that are for the nodes that are connected with interface lines, and then a set of two files for those that have their spillcrest or invert linked to 2D without an interface line. The reason two files is one has the direction of 1D to 2D and the other one has a 2D to 1D. So these files, again, are invoked by going into the 2D job control and making sure you produce the check files and that you write X1D check files. You place this as your parameter in the control file of the advanced settings with the value of on. Once you do that, it's creating CSV files, which of course you could open into Excel like I've done here. The positive and negative is essentially, you know, directional, right? If you have a file that is from 1D to 2D, flow going that direction would be positive, but if the flow reverses and it goes 2D to 1D in the 1D to 2D file, it will show up as negative. So the negative in the flow is just a indication of direction. A flow from A to B, it's a negative B to A, if you will. 
All right, let me go back to XP Swim for a moment and show you where that happens to be found in the software. It's under Configuration, Job Control, 2D Model Settings. So I've already solved this with Produce Check Files. And in the Advanced Settings, I've written in here, Write 1D Check Files, and I've had a value of On. If you wanted to turn it off, of course, you could just type in here, Off, or you could just simply uncheck the flag. Well, I've run it, and what does it produce? Well, let me start up Excel here, and it should be in my history of files. Here's one of them. So it brings up and opens into Excel this CSV file that has um, each of the node exchanges uh, the, and the flows. Let me just go to a point in time where I actually have some flows happening. Uh, let's see if I can find that. All right, so here, for example, it's gone from 1.5 to 1.51, minus 0.4, remember the directional part with the uh, uh, indication of positive or negative flows. So at every time step, and for all the nodes that are exchanging, I can see these hydrographs listed here in a tabular, in a tabular, tabular view. All right, the next part of my presentation is going to talk about the 2D flood maps and the display and drilling down into that level of detail that we can present. I'm going to talk maybe about the choice of things that you can see and their time interval, but also their display properties. The facts that you can have a maximum or you could have the time series and you can animate that time series. That it can be shown as a color fill or and or you know contours. That color ramp, transparency, range, results, labels are things that you can drill down into in order to make an excellent presentation and be able to uh, get down into all different kinds of level of detail. About the 2D map types, under the 2D job control, there's a section called map result types. And you can tick on the various boxes. In the case of my model, I've looked at velocity, water depth, water elevation, and hazard. Those are the most common ones that I look at. The hazard part may be a new idea to some of you, but in places in the world where 2D modeling is very advanced, they are always creating hazard maps. Hazard is the product of velocity times depth. In fact, it's a recognition that shallow moving flow can also be dangerous, as well as um, deep flow you know, could cause damage as well. But the energy that's in fast moving flow is important and creates a hazard. Here's an example of a 2D map sample. In this case, I'm showing the maximum water depth. It's something that I usually turn on after I've solved a model. I've got it somewhat transparent, so I can see through to the various layers below as well. All right, let me switch over to the software now and start talking about that. So I'm going to scroll down here in the layer control panel and turn on the maximum water depth. And in my case, I've got the maximum water depth being shown as a color shading with the contours. Let's look at that by right-click, Properties. And I've chosen from the list Fill and Smooth Contours. Now, my contours are set up here as a contour interval of 1 with first contour at 0. So the 0 depth contour, that's like the inundation extent. You can restrict the display. For example, you could restrict the display so that you didn't see any real shallow flows, like say the first two inches or about 50 millimeters. Clicking the OK button then would um, make that shrink a little bit and not show me the extreme uh, inundation extent with the shallow flows. I'll put that back to zero or maybe I just won't even restrict the display. You choose between perhaps showing the contours or not by maybe I just pick filled. And here I can change the transparency. I can reverse directions, red, shallow, blue, deep, or the reverse. And click the OK button. 
now that I have the map displayed, if I bring my cursor to a certain spot on there and look in the status bar, where I'm holding the cursor right now, I can see that the max water depth is 0.45 meters. Here in the pond, it's 2.23 meters deep. Here in the deep part of the channel, it's 4.37 meters deep. Right-clicking again on the map, going to Properties. These color pegs can be moved. They can be changed color. I think I'll show that perhaps with a different layer. Let me first go to an animation of the water depth, and I'm going to couple that with the velocity vectors. And as I um, show my water depth, let me just clean up a couple things here. I'm going to turn off the quick data view. And I'm look, there we are. Here's my animation. and I'm going to play it, press the play button. And as I step through time, you can start to see the level of extent expanding. I'm going to maybe pause this and just advance it manually till I can see some strategic things happening. So I'm going to zoom in to the upper left-hand corner of the model, and I could see now that the water has come out of the nodes and is traveling down the streets. Now the level of detail, right, you, I can drill down by just um, holding the cursor there and I can see in the status bar that the depth is 0.1, but it's also possible to right click properties and display the results label. So I'm going to tick this box to display the results label and place it in black, not skip any results, but now I'm going to be showing the depth at every cell. I'll zoom in so that we can actually read the text. And this is um, an animation, so as I advance in time, the numbers will change, showing me the depth in every cell at every time step. Let me turn that off now. So the display looks a little bit better. And you can also see what I've done in this case, uh, slightly different for the fill colors. I've actually specified by, you know, moving the color peg to a certain spot. So this is every half meter, and I've chosen flat start, which gives sharp edges as it color transitions. So let me um, zoom out a little bit here. Sorry about all the screen changes. I know that sometimes that takes a little bit of time for you to um, get the update. But I'm going to go to a point in time where it's a little bit more flooded. And you'll see here that I've got various levels of color graduation. And of course, this is where we're transitioning from one depth to the next. All right, one of my maps happens to be um, hazard, so let me go and display the maximum hazard. You'll notice that the maximum hazard has just simply three colors, green, yellow, and red. This is not like a hardwired thing, it's a user setting. So if I right click and go to properties, I could put this back to um, the original colors. Maybe I could load the color scheme um, that I've got set for this project. Webinar. Here's the default scheme, right? And if I click OK on that, there's the default scheme. But I want to use a rule-based item that perhaps says, and I've saved, since saved this, with green, yellow, and red. I'm saying that if the hazard, the product of velocity times depth, is between zero and then this um, position of this peg, which happens to be um, 0.5. Let's move it to 0.5. And then at one, we transition to red. And so as I click the OK button, I can see that the areas of very high hazard where the product of velocity times depth is greater than one, it's in red. So this isn't a place to be, right? You would be drowned or swept off your feet if you happen to find yourself 
in areas of the red hazard, including there's some up here as well. So those, that color graduation is something that you can simply um, save and then reload to another model or to another map type that you're looking at. All right, what about exporting these results? Back to my PowerPoint for a moment. You can directly export from the various layers in the layer control panel with a right click. You simply right click on the layer and you can choose export the current results time step, which is to a CSV file. The CSV file will have easting, northing, and then the whatever map that you're exporting. If it was max hazard, it would be easting, northing, max hazard in a comma delimited text file. If you choose export results, then you get to create an ASCII grid or a map info file or a shape file. And this is basically arcs or, if you will, the contours that you're generating. You can um, also directly export, not necessarily from the graphics layer, but now from the 2D model results through a tool called the XP2D Interface Utility. It's accessed under the Tools menu, and you can select it, choose the option to export 2D results to GIS. You choose the uh, binary file that contains all the results, that's XMDF. You can create, for example, uh, ArcGIS shape file, map info files, or uh, ArcGIS ASCII grid file. There's a little bit of a difference here by choosing, for example, export to shape. If you export to shape from the layer, it produces arcs that are from the contours. If you're using the tool and you are creating a shape file, it's a shape file of points. Um, and I think I'll, I'll get right on that and, and show that to you. So let me switch to the software now. If I wanted to, for example, create a set of, well, a shape file that had, for example, all of these contours, which I could show. Here's the fill and the smooth contours being displayed. So if I was to right click and export these results and choosing, um, say, the shape file, I've already done this actually, I uh, did that earlier. So let me show you that I can actually attach that as by just right clicking on GIS files and loading that same GIS file. And that would be this one, this shape file. So I'll just maybe zoom in. And you'll be able to see the black lines here. These are the G this is the GIS shape file being displayed in XP. I'm toggling it on and off here. It's the same set of lines that you saw as the contours. So instead of just like swapping over the screen now to GIS, I'm just showing the GIS file in XP, but likewise you can just directly bring it into XP, uh, swim directly rather than taking it to GIS. Now the utility works slightly different, so under the tools menu, there's an XP2D interface utility. The utility has a few different possibilities, but the one I'm concentrating on today for you is 2D results to GIS. I can select the input file. In this case, it's under output. It's the XMDF, or the binary file that's holding the 2D results. And it automatically suggests, based on your output properties, what the file will be. So I'm going to create a shape file of the depths. I could do all the time steps. I could pick a particular time step, you know, the 45th one. Uh, or I could just do the maximum. So I'm going to do the maximum, and it's going to create a shape file. And it's going to sample the, the 2D flooding in a grid here perhaps every two meters. So if you wanted to make 
two meter or ten feet, right? If my model happened to be US units, you can make that grid. So I'm going to make a grid and then execute. And it um, generates that shape file. It says press enter to close. I'll press enter to close. Close this. Again, that's something that you could definitely show uh, in the GIS file. So let me right click and load the GIS file of the um, every two meter result. I'll zoom in and it's going to click here and zoom in and you can see the various points. Now remembering the quick data view can show us GIS data. So I'm turning on the quick data view. Uh, GIS and I'm going to with my pointer tool select some of these points. Let me just promote that layer in the layer control panel. And go back to quick data view. So this is depth 0.285. This spot is depth 0.51 as you can see. All right, I have a, another topic to talk about, so let me switch to my PowerPoint for a moment. The next thing I want to talk to you about is called time series outputs. Time series outputs um, support flow and head and velocity results. For the flow, you can draw a polyline, and the convention is positive flow is left to right looking downstream and for getting head and velocity you can digitize points and the points can be digitized and you can pick up the water elevation over time you can also pick up the velocity and the velocity direction let me show that to you now in the software let me go back to my layer control panel I've already had some of these digitized on the screen and I'll just maybe point them out to you. I mean, for example, this green line right here is the stream overflow. So I drew a line to measure flows. So all the flows that measure this can now be um, tabulated by selecting it. Uh, you can and right-click graphing, or you can show flow graphs here by clicking show flow graphs. And if I wanted to see the specific stream overflow, this is the hydrograph that has been generated by all the flow that crossed the green line. So that's all the flow that overtopped the road, if you will. This is a hydrograph of that. Similarly, at the top, I created a line across the street to measure the manhole overflow. This is the manhole overflow graph. You can see it has a peak rate of about 0.38 or 0.39 cubic meters per second. So it's a pretty high rate. Maybe it's something like you know, 15, 20 liters per second has um, flowed down the street. And it happens around 15 minutes to about 25 minutes into the simulation. So I can drill down to details. For the head velocity points, there happens to be a head velocity point right here in the intersection. And I can graph those, and if I drill down into the detail of the head velocity point called intersection, I can see over time that the water elevation goes from about 46.42 to about 46.85 or about 0.4 meters deep. That's about 18 inches or so. So I've got a fairly high depth in there, but if I turn on the option to show the velocity, I can also see it's moving at quite a speed at the peak almost 1.6 meters per second and at the following angles so usually it's an angle of around 60 seconds or so so these time series outputs you can create many of them you can just drop them where on areas of interest you need to have them before you run the model and they are stored by the engine and it's calculating as the model solving all of these hydrographs if you will stage versus time flow versus time hydrographs. Another topic I have for you is to talk about 2D results post-processing. 
under the tools menu, there's results post-processing where you can create a hazard scheme, your own uh, scheme to decide on what coloration should be used based on various ranges and applying a hazard value. Also, you can create a separate map for inundation time. As mentioned, it's accessed under the Tools menu under Results Post-Processing. I'm going to start with applying the hazard value. If you click on Apply Hazard Value, you can then create a hazard value. I've, in this case, I've called it My Hazard. If I edit it, you can create your own formula. For example, typically the hazard is velocity times depth, but if you wanted the velocity times 3 times the velocity divided by 2. You can just build this kind of an equation in there. I'll choose this one and I'll choose my current model results. If you load separate model results then you can find in this combo box separate results that you wanted to be applying your own hazard value. You click apply and mm, about 60 seconds or 30 seconds later, uh, it will create for you the hazard value in the layer control panel. Of course, I've already done it. I'm doing a little bit of the cooking show thing here where I'm pulling out the roast already made. <laughs> so you didn't have to wait for the time for it to compute that. So for example, here is my max hazard. Uh, I will maybe make it a little darker and you can see that max hazard based on my new formulation for hazard, right? That's, that's the point. You can make up your own rule. It's not just velocity times depth. It, it's velocity, depth, maybe also debris factor. What do I mean by debris factor? Well, each of our given land uses could have a debris factor based on the depth of flow. So if I turn on hazard debris factor, I can add rows and essentially I could say, well, if it's a half a meter deep, maybe this is debris factor one, whereas if it's one foot deep, maybe the debris factor is three. Because deep, fast moving water will pick up debris, this is just a lot more hazard. I would rather be standing in clean moving water than uh, water that was moving, you know, objects which could cut and so on and penetrate a building, etc. So the, your hazards then can take into account that type of an approach where debris is also representative of some sort of hazard. Now the, uh, the last thing uh, I'm going to talk about is the results processing for a hazard scheme. Now the hazard scheme is not only like your own rules, but a coloration or graduation of how you will include that. So I'll just kind of load one here that I had already set up before, kind of give you an idea on how it works. So for example, I've picked up one here called the QRA, the Queensland Roads Authority. They specify hazards as low, significant, high, or extreme based on your result set. You could apply this, and let me go down just to a little bit more detail for you here. You create essentially rules, different conditions. I have set up three conditions, the depth condition, the velocity, and a condition for the hazard velocity times depth. So for low, I'm saying, well, condition one is that the depth has to be less than a half meter the velocity, and then I have this inequality that the velocity is less than 1.5 meters per second, and the product of velocity times depth needs to be less than 0.6. So you give various ranges and colors, and if I say, okay, the x-axis will be the velocity, the y-axis will be the depth, let me just color this say between a range of 0 and 3, it'll kind of give you a little bit bigger picture here and update the graph. You can see that I'm going to use blue if the hazard happens to be anywhere in this range, or yellow, or orange, or red. 
Now I've done this um, earlier with my own scheme it had only the two colors blue and yellow but I've already done that and applied it about two minutes later it can produce this kind of a map for here's my scheme here's my max scheme so areas of blue areas of yellow of course that's also a time series the reason for the um, say one or two minute um, processing time is that it does it for every time step for every location so now I can perhaps play this or I could advance to a certain point in time and I can see various areas showing up with yellow let me go to a spot that's a little bit more indicative right maybe here so I can see I've got yellow versus blue the hazard would be um, higher here I think I called it moderate in my scheme versus blue. Let me um, finish my um, tutorial with you by letting you have another idea. For example, we have seen some uh, users actually couple 2D modeling results to virtual reality software. In this case, it's going to be for the city of Redlands, California, and this animation was done in software called Visual Studio by Form8. They're a Japanese uh, software developer. And the, uh, the animation was prepared by um, RBF Michael Baker. I'll pause this because I'm not sure how fast you are getting the feed from me over the internet, but this is XP Swim results that are being placed into the VR software that's simulating rain and wind and traffic patterns and um, human behavior, but you can see the, uh, the model results in this VR simulation. Thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. I think we went a little bit late, but there's a lot of information, so um, thanks for joining us. Tony, thank you very much for your expertise and for taking your time to do this presentation today. Well, my pleasure. Have a wonderful day, everybody, and thank you for joining us again. We'll see you next time.